Hello, welcome to our Facebook Live today. My name is Esther and I'm so glad to see you all with us today. Uh, if you haven't yet, please let us know where you're joining us from, what's it like in your part of the world. Uh, I see users from all over. So thank you everybody for joining us. Let us know if it's your first My Heritage Facebook Live that you're with us for, or if you've been to a few of our Facebook Lives. We've been doing Facebook Lives here at My Heritage twice a week uh, for almost a year. And we've had some really fantastic sessions here from experts around the world in genealogy, DNA, family history, and my heritage. And uh, we have had just about every topic that you can think of. <laughs> you can access all of our past Facebook Lives on the My Heritage Facebook channel facebook.com slash myheritage under the videos section and there's a great variety you can rewatch all of our old sessions in addition even today's session will be available thereafter so in case you miss anything uh, it's good to know I see we have a lot of people that are joining us for the first time uh, thanks for letting us know Andre and uh, let's see Robin from California uh, lots of people joining us for the first time. So welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us today. We hope that you'll join us for more Facebook Lives in the future. We love hosting these and connecting with my heritage users from around the world, bringing you fantastic content. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have a great session for you today. Before I get to it, I just want to let you know uh, we've had some great releases at MyHeritage recently, some exciting new features that we uh, are just really thrilled about, and we are excited for you all to try them as well. We recently released the MyHeritage Photo Restore, which restores the colors in faded color photos. So photos that you might have from the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, I know some of my childhood photos, they've become a little faded or yellow, and you just put them in the My Heritage Photo Restore, and all of a sudden it just restores the authentic, genuine uh, colors, and it just makes them look as if they were taken yesterday. So it's really an exciting feature that uh, is just, it brings the photos to life. And I think that we can all agree that any tool that just improves the colors and makes the photos look a little bit more real can really help us connect with them. So it's a really exciting feature. Besides for that, we've also released the MyHeritage Photo Storyteller, which is within the MyHeritage mobile app and allows you to record a story with, with a photo. So it's, you can take your mobile app while you're with family members when you're able to see them and record them talking about the photo, telling you about it, who's in it. I see some comments here about our users who have already used the restore feature. So glad to hear. I love, love seeing what everybody thinks about these features that we come out with. It's just so nice to hear how you've enjoyed them so far. So thanks for letting us know. And if you have used these two features, please write in the comment section. Let us know what you think. So for today's show, we will be talking a lot about photos. We have with us Maureen Taylor, and she'll be talking about identifying and improving ancestral snapshots. So in order to get into the photo mood, <laughs> in case we're not already, we'll be doing a giveaway today for, photo, for a MyHeritage Complete Plan. And the MyHeritage Complete Plan, for those of you who are new to MyHeritage, who might not know, is the best plan that we have to offer at MyHeritage. Uh, it includes unlimited access to 13 billion historical records, unlimited family tree size, as well as free and unlimited access to our photo tools that I was describing. So that's uh, all of our new tools. That's the My, My Heritage in Color, which includes the Restore, and My Heritage, the My Heritage Photo Enhancer. So how do you enter this draw? Well, very simple. Today, since we're talking about photos, all that you have to do is tell us about uh, an exciting, fascinating photo that you have in your family. So it could be the oldest family photo that you have. It could be a family photo that you have with many generations. Maybe you have a photo with five different generations, which is really an incredible find. Uh, let us know about the most interesting, fascinating photo that you have in your family. We want to hear about it. 
and you can just leave that in the comment section. And at the end of today's session, after the questions, we will choose one lucky winner. Uh, so now without further ado, I want to introduce our wonderful speaker today. We have with us Maureen Taylor. She is known as the photo detective and she is an internationally renowned expert in historic photo identification, preservation, and also in genealogical research. And it's not her first time on our show. If you haven't listened to her other talks, you definitely should afterwards as well. Uh, but we're very excited for this new topic. So let me bring her on to say hello. Hello, Maureen. Hi, everyone. How are nice you to today? See you all. Good, good, Esther. Good. So glad it's great to, to see, see you. everyone. We're really yeah. excited about this topic. I can't wait to talk about snapshots. I have all kinds of cool stuff to talk about. Oh, I can't wait to see what you have prepared because I know that when you come to speak, you always have the most interesting photos to show us. Yeah, yeah, I do. And I have some restore examples. Amazing, amazing. So should I bring up your slides? Yeah, let me bring up my slides. Okay. And for everyone, Esther, I put in the host chat a link to a handout uh, to put into the chat at the end of the presentation. It turns out I can't do it from here, but um, if you could do that, that would be great. Sure, yeah, I'll add that in so that everyone can see it in the comments. All right, yes, yeah, so you can bring my slides up into this into the uh Okay. I think you just have to be in presenter mode and then it'll be There we are. Perfect. Take it away. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for joining uh us today here on the My Heritage Facebook page. Uh this is a not a brand new topic for me, but the way I have packaged all these different tips for you is brand new. I did a lot of work. As a matter of fact, this morning, I was playing with snapshots and scanning and all these little devices that I'd accumulated that I never had the time to work with. Um, so I was playing with all of that today and I have some eye popping examples to show you. So today's talk is Say Cheese, Preserve, Identify and Improve Ancestral Photos. And here we go. So this is a iconic family image for me. This is my maternal grandmother and um, it's a birthday cake and a birthday party for her. And we're gonna go into some more details about this photograph, but also the My Heritage Photo Restore, the color res restoration uh, at the end of the presentation. So be sure to stick around for that. This is the only grandparent I ever knew. Uh, so this is a very special photograph for me. So what is a snapshot? So a snapshot is a casual photograph made typically by an amateur with a small handheld camera. That's it, it's a candid image. Now, of course, today our snapshots are with our cell phones, uh, but there's a long history of snapshot photography and you'll start to see what I'm talking about as I give you examples. And I have some really cool stuff. Uh, I am Maureen Taylor. I'm known as the photo detective. You can find me online at maureentaylor.com. And I hope you'll stay to the very end of the presentation because I do have, I don't usually do this for my heritage, but I put together a two page handout for you on snapshots, sort of a resource guide for you. So they'll share the link at the end of the presentation. Uh, and you'll be able to grab it later. If you want more information about who I am or photographs and photo history in general, um, take a listen to my podcast. I interview industry influencers and entrepreneurs and doing cool things with photographs. Uh, this month in February, the entire focus of the podcast is on uh, tintypes tintypes, uh, the photographers that actually take tintypes today, uh, identifying, preserving them, all about tintypes. So you can find my podcast on my website or at iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or Amazon Music. Uh, it is a lot of fun to put together because basically I like talking to people and people like sharing their stories. What are we going to cover this afternoon? We're going to cover identifying snapshots, because maybe you don't know enough about them. 
So when I first started lecturing about identifying family photographs, the photo mysteries were uh, 19th century, mid and late 19th century photo mysteries. But now, all these years later, it turns out that snapshots are the mysteries, that we have so many snapshots, you know, starting our family photograph collections really explode as of about 1900 with just lots and lots of pictures. Pretty much everybody had a camera and they were taking pictures all the time, but they didn't always write the information on the back. And then we're gonna talk about preserving some of these types of photographs and also how to make them look better. And as I found out today, it confirmed for me, is there anything worse than a 1970s snapshot? I think not. So first off in the chat, and Esther, maybe you can help me with this because I can't see the chat, is I'd like to know what your greatest snapshot challenge is. You could put that in the chat, that would be great. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna put my phone back on and turn the volume down so I can see the chat. Um, and Any everyone can, they can just uh, write in the chat now and we'll we'll read out a few of the challenges if you'd like. If everyone that, can just write what your greatest snapshot challenge is for us in the comments. That would be great. I have a couple of questions sprinkled throughout this, Esther. Okay, great. So feel free to comment, everybody, as you see Maureen's questions come up. I see that um, Lionel says dates, location, and who the people are. Okay. Uh, Sharon says something similar, identifying people who are long gone. Uh, Karen says pictures fading in time. Well, that's a, that's a My Heritage solution over there. <laughs> there you go. Um, I see, let's see, uh, Bridget, greatest challenge is identifying the people in the photos. I, I see that's a very common one. <laughs> yeah. Um, Amy says, I have a photo that got wet and stuck to another one. Okay. All right. When we get to the preservation section, that would be a good question to ask. Let's, let's move on with this. So I mentioned that a snapshot is any picture. And thank you, Esther. I mentioned that a snapshot is any picture taken with a handheld camera. But not all snapshots are the same. So they were different size negatives and they were prints. And there's no comprehensive list of what was taken when. In other words, how many cameras, what size film, how long was it around? There are little guides here and there, but no comprehensive list of that. And these cameras, unlike the cameras we use today, they stayed in use for decades, as long as the film was available. And I know in one instance, some snapshot film was available for more than 50 years. So you can't just date a snapshot based on the format of the, of the negative, for instance. So let's jump into identifying snapshots. My signature five, uh, because I'm the photo detective and I help people with their photo mysteries, um, are the who, what, where, when, and why of a picture. So who's in the photo and who took it? That's a common question. What are they wearing? And how does that relate to who they might be? Where was it taken? When was it taken? That's another very common question. You might, not, you might know who, but not when. And then why was it taken? How can you interpret those results and come up with the story behind the image? So here's a cool picture for you. This is the Chicago uh, World's Fair in 1893, and that's the very first Ferris wheel. And each one of those little cars contained 60 people. So it's pretty packed in there as you went around. But why would I bring the Chicago World's Fair into a talk about snapshots? Because when you went to the fair, the Kodak company had a booth where you could rent a camera for the day and take pictures of your experiences at the fair. So there are lots of pictures in snapshot albums of the Chicago World's Fair. And just because I think it's cool to know what kinds of cameras existed when, and I have a 
not a huge collection of cameras, but I do add a camera now and then. And during this pandemic, I added this camera. Um, I get most of my cameras from this little antique shop called Picture This Antiques. This is an 1898 Corona Special. It used a four by six glass plate and is somewhat considered a snapshot camera because it's the, you know, it's a handheld camera. And yes, that's the original tripod that comes with it. So our, our sometimes there were glass plate negatives from which our snapshots were made. Mostly it's film. And here's an interesting one for you. Some of these early formats are quite distinctive. How about this one from about 1890? It is a circular image. Uh, and this is something that the early Kodak cameras and uh, film took. So the early Kodak cameras had a roll of film. You could take a hundred images and believe me, I own some of these cameras. And when you look through the viewfinder, you don't know how they were able to capture any picture at all clearly um, because it's so fuzzy in this little tiny glass thing you're looking down into. But this is about 1890, a hundred images on the roll. And then you'd send it off to the, you send the camera off to the factory for the pictures to be developed. And then it would come back fully loaded with a new roll of film and you would get prints. And our ancestors were really, really interested in snapshot photography. Snapshot cameras and photography put them in the driver's seat. So for the first time, we have candid images of like a woman rowing a boat or, um, taking pictures of their children in the backyard. We have mom and grandma in the kitchen cooking. We have people everywhere sitting on their porch. They're not dressed up particularly fancy for their pictures. They're as they are every day. And there were magazines galore to help them hone their skills as a photographer. But one of the cameras that really took off with great speed was a camera not for, and as you can see, most of the photographers uh, early on were men, although there were cameras later for women and they came in different colors to match your outfit, of course. Uh, but there was a camera called the Brownie, which was introduced in 1900. The photo format is two and a quarter inches square, just like this image. And there's the camera um, right next to this picture. So this two and a quarter inch picture of this mystery woman under a blanket with a baby with dad's head cut off and just the back end of the horse is a snapshot taken with the brownie camera. Likely an older sibling of the baby took this picture. So if you find images that are two and a quarter inches, then you may know that they were taken by the brownie or one of the brownie knockoffs. And there certainly were lots of brownie knockoffs. And just so you get a sense of how big these cameras were. Here's an image of a woman with a tiny brownie taking a picture of her friend who's taking a picture of her. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures in my collection because they're obviously having a great time. Unfortunately, I don't have the other side of this, this storytelling. But what about the clues in a photograph? Because that helps us as well, not just photo format, but what's happening in the picture. So let's count the clues. And here's another question for you to answer. I want you to take a look at this image and name a clue in it. Because it's all about paying attention to the details. Could we have everyone write in the comment section if they see a clue in this photo? Well, I Let's love see. some of the comments, Esther. They're great. Yeah, some really fantastic comments already. I see that, um, oh, we already have some of the clues coming in. Karen says she sees background buildings. Um, Olaf says beach changing areas. Oh, I didn't even notice that that's what those were. <laughs> that's what those are. Um, Judy says clothes, the hats, the style. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Craig says, what's that easel? Is there That's a chair. Oh, it's a chair. <laughs> it's a beach chair. Um, let's see. The bathing houses, Amy says. Uh, Emma says, the style of the chairs. Yes, the style of the chairs. Exactly. It's all the little details that help us. How about the street lights? Plus, what we can tell from this scene is that there's some sort of platform up there where people are sitting uh, up above the beach. You can see a little railed in area with people viewing the beach without being on the beach, which is interesting. So I have no idea where this picture was taken. This is a, a random collection of snapshots that I that somebody sent me. Um, I've been slowly working on some of them, but this one's a mystery. But those are the clues, the kinds of clues that you look for, including things like, let's think about the 20th century. Let's just take fashion for an instance. So in the 20th century, fashion for women changed dramatically and that fashion was to be worn and it was supposed to be comfortable and more women were in the workplace. So we have more everyday attire. But let's think about certain details of it. So skirts, if we think about the 20th century, not the 21st century, but the 20th century, the skirts get shorter throughout the century with the shortest skirts before the mini skirts being in 1923. And then uh, for hair, let's think about what happens with women's hair. So we start out the 20th century, we end the 19th century, we begin the 20th century, pretty much everyone's got long hair. But then in the United States, for instance, women get the vote in 1920 and suddenly it's fashionable to bob your hair as a whole style. So it goes short. And then as we know, in the 1960s, hair gets a lot longer. Now it's shorter again. And men's hair starts out very short, but gets longer later in the century. And we can date things by like the shape and style of a cuff or a sleeve or a dress. Where's the waist of that dress? So we have early, sort of the 19 teens on the left, in the middle under hair, we have a 1920s image. And then consider this, clothing for play for children makes a debut in the 20th century. So suddenly we get play outfits. If you look at mail order catalogs, for instance, there's a lot more themed play outfits for kids. This is casual clothing, not meant to you know go to grandma's house in, but to go play in the backyard. Um, if you're not wearing somebody's hand-me-downs. And one of the clues I want you to look for, and if you have one of these, I want you to send me uh, the image with the writing on the bottom because there was a type of camera that actually is a camera and a clue. There is something called the autographic Kodak. And yes, I do own one of those and I was just ever so happy to find this. Um, it was available from about 1915 to 1926. And it came with a stylus and you could, there was a little window on the back of the camera and you could write with the stylus on the negative as to what was happening um, in this picture. So like under this advertisement, Betty's fifth birthday, and this says 1914. Um, so that obviously says it was available before 1915, you know, uh, different sites lift different beginning dates for some of these things. So look for images that actually have something written on the bottom that was not written in with an ink thing, but written with a stylus on the back of the camera. Very helpful. But let's talk about captions for a minute because even in an autographic camera, the caption is key. So who writes the captions on the back? Is the person who took the picture writing the caption or is that later? And this says, dad, myself, and Ann. So there's dad, we know he's in the middle, but who's myself? Is that the little kid and Ann is on the stoop? Or is myself the elderly woman and Ann the little kid? It's hard to know. They say dad looks like my son, all right. So we know from the second part of the caption that myself is the child and Ann is sitting on the stoop but you have to question it. Can you recognize the handwriting? Who might have written it? What kind of contextual clues are there for the picture? This is a series of images I believe were taken in England in this big snapshot collection that I um, got. 
And you have to think about events and place. So I happen to know everything about it, to know about this picture or so I think. It's my mom, first communion in the backyard of their house. And I think I know where it was taken. Um, so that gives me a sort of a date if I can figure out when she made her first communion and a place if I can figure out where they were living from city directory records. And my heritage has a fabulous city directory collection, by the way. Um, if I can figure all this out, then I can actually put a lot more information with this picture. So here's the thing, a snapshot is powerful. All we see of someone at any moment is a snapshot of their life. There they are in riches or poverty, in joy or despair. And snapshots don't show the million decisions that led to that moment. And this is by Rick, Richard Bach. We don't know what somebody was thinking about when they had that picture taken unless they wrote it down or they told us the story. We don't know how much posing went on behind the scenes or cleaning of various things went on behind the scenes, posturing for that image. And snapshots are very different than posed images in a studio. So one of the things that you need to look for when you're looking at your snapshots is technology. Now, this is actually a common type of image. It's a Christmas card with an image on it. And I know mostly photo uh, Christmas cards are uh, American or so some of my uh, British friends have told me. But this is something very interesting. So these people actually posed for their Christmas card in front of their new wireless radio. Uh, and so that would help date the image. Like we know we can figure out when this type of linen style card was available. Um, I don't know who Mr. and Mrs. E. Thomas are, and there's nothing on this to tell me where, but we do have them posed not only in front of the radio, but we have a picture of a child looks like they're in a uh, investments for, the ch for, for being an altar boy at the church. And there is another picture hanging up on the wall. So if we did know who they were, we could look at those pictures. And by the way, when you use the MyHeritage photo tools, oftentimes the, the little circles that pop out of faces, it will pick up the faces in the pictures on the wall and on the mantle, which is very cool. And then you're probably wondering, well, what are those mysterious numbers on the back of the images? Well, um, those are the photo developing numbers. And sometimes you can match them up to come up with all the different pictures in a roll. So when I mentioned that Kodak had the 100 uh, images in a roll, actually many of them either didn't come out or weren't very good. So, and then that period they didn't have photo developing. But as the century progresses, there are photo developing numbers on the back of the pictures. They're stamped or written on the back. So if I had a collection, like this big random snapshot collection that I have from all periods. Uh, when I first got it, one of the things I did was lay it all out and match them up because they're all randomly grouped together. They're not all one family. There were like the Grape Arbor House and the, you know, there are certain people that we matched up like that uh, family on the stoop uh, matching up by photo developing number, for instance, to try to recreate the role of which all these pictures came. Because that context, you know, you were always told when you were in school, if you can't understand what a word means when you're reading, if you study the context of where that word is on the page, then you might be able to intuit what the meaning is. The same with these photo developing numbers. If you can put together the whole role or even part of the role, you'll have a much greater sense of what's happening in all the pictures. Now, people did keep film in their cameras for a very long time sometimes. So you have to think about that as well. But you also need to consider, oh, Catherine mentioned that the piece of furniture in that radio picture is a Singer Treadles uh, sewing machine. Thank you so much for that. You have to think in a snapshot about who's in the picture, but who's not. Um, this is my cousin as a baby. And 
He doesn't know that he's in this presentation. Uh, and that's his mom. Uh, but who's taking the picture? That's the question. I don't know. And there's uh, several pictures on this day. And sometimes families like swap the camera back and forth so you can get a sense if you can put the whole day together, you know who's holding the camera when. But in this case, I do not. But always consider who's holding the camera as well as in the picture. And how are you gonna sort out all these clues? Well, certainly, you know, I'm around to help as the photo detective, but other sources of information are other family members, that's your best source. Um, perhaps there's something very particular in the picture, like the radio. You could maybe Google that. You might be able to find a book at the library, but it may mean that you have to talk to someone who's actually an expert at dating radios. All of these things are possibilities. So what happens when you have an unidentified photograph? So one of the group groupings that I've been able to match up are four images, and it's two people standing on a mountaintop here. You've got a man and a woman on the left, and then on the right, oh, I should colorize this, Esther. I should have colorized this one for the presentation. And then we have two men uh, on the right, again, standing in a similar position. What do we know? They're on a mountaintop. We can see the river, how it curves, but we don't, there's not really a whole lot of um, clues. In the second batch, we can see that there's a factory of some sort in the background. The young women are sitting on the rock in a different place. Now we see a few more people. All of these were taken on the same day and I did not know where it was taken. Uh, I put it online and asked for some feedback and sometimes this works. Obviously nobody's gonna be able to identify these people. Although I will say that right now there's tons of stories in the news about people finding collections of photographs. They think they're just so special. They wanna identify them and people are out there trying to solve them. If they can do that, I have a closet full of these snapshots that I that are just random that I could use help with. Um, but this one I put online and asked if anyone knew the location and it literally went around the world in under 24 hours. Um, and someone in England identified this as being Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. This is about in the 1940s and you can't get close to the edge anymore. Lookout Mountain has all kinds of safety procedures now and a little place, uh, like a little visitors uh, building as well. And it all worked out. It was, in fact, Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. Um, so I now know the location, but not the who. And I sort of know the when based on how they're dressed. And let's talk about preserving. So here's another question for you. What's your number one snapshot preservation concern? I'm looking at the chat. There's a little bit of a delay, so it does take time for everyone. Oh, yeah. To it <laughs> get does, this but I'm looking at these comments. There really are some really nice comments also for the uh, giveaway. I see some really great ones about uh, special photos that everyone has in their family. And for anyone who's joining us midway, just to tell you all, uh, let us know about an important, special, interesting photograph that you have in your family for your chance to win. Oh, I see some comments coming in here. So uh, Marnie says fading, Craig says expense of the materials to archive them. Uh, Karen says disintegration, a lot of questions about how to store them. Uh, Kimberly says the photos cracking. Uh, yeah, Trina yeah. says how to save them long-term. So a lot of questions about um, I guess not knowing exactly what to do in terms of preserving those photos. So we're gonna talk about that right now. And I'm gonna answer that wet photo question in just a minute as well. Um, thank you, Esther, for coordinating the questions. Um, first off, do you have to keep them all? Well, guess what? I just found another box of photographs. Uh, and I thought, you know, because we moved a few years ago. So I found these tucked away and there's a lot of snapshots in them. And now I have to follow my own advice, which is get rid of all badly composed images. In other words, I have some that are so blurry, not even the My Heritage Enhancement tool is going to help. It's like somebody was shaking the camera when they took it. Should I keep that? Probably not. I'm not even sure who's in the picture. 
if you were the two print, three print type of person where you've got multiple copies of the same picture, do you really need those? Maybe not. Single prints and a scan will probably do you. If somebody in the family does scrapbooking, maybe they would love those duplicate and triplicate prints. And then you wanna pare down your vacation images to the basics. Um, how many pictures, and I'm working on a blog post about this, how many pictures does it take to tell a person's life story? Um, so watch for that. But what don't you want to weed? And certainly you don't want to ever weed vintage images and images with family in them. You don't wanna get rid of those. Uh, and then films and negatives. I'm gonna talk more about films and negatives in just a minute and why you shouldn't. And I'm gonna show you what I was playing around with this morning. Um, you wanna scan everything. So how are you gonna scan things? Well, I have a flatbed scanner and one of the best things to get is a flatbed scanner. It is flexible. So I can scan 19th century images, I can scan negatives, and I can scan slides. And I tried with the negatives today and it worked pretty well. Uh, an all-in-one machine, if you only have snapshots to scan, then it will work. But if you have older 19th century images, it might not do a good job. Um, your, your phone, your smartphone, um, smart, newer smartphone cameras take high resolution images and you can use that. Um, there are apps that you can use as well. Google Photo Scan is one that's been out for a while, and there's a company app called Photo Mine that you can use as well. Um, you can also, I believe I saw it in the My Heritage mobile app, there's a way for you to photograph images and put them right in your My Heritage account. Is that right, Esther? Did I see that flashing through my app when I was working with it earlier today? Yep, we have the scanner in the My Heritage mobile app. Uh, we'll put a link in the comment section as well for how to use that, but it, it's a great way of easily scanning your photos and having them uploaded to your My Heritage photos uh, immediately. So yeah, great tool to know about. Yeah, and Olaf's right. Isn't the quality of an iPad or iPhone as good as a scanner? Pretty much. Nowadays, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So scanning resolution, if you are gonna use a regular scanner, um, the preservation standards of the Library of Congress and other libraries around the world is 1200 DPI as a TIFF file with a minimum of 600 DPI. These are big files. You need a portable hard drive and I recommend an SSD drive, not just a portable drive and definitely not a flash drive. Um, uh, these are great for preservation, but they're way too large to use in many programs and online. So you want to make sure that you resize or maybe even scan twice. And certainly it's easy to resize these days for sharing online. Online, you really only want to share at 72 DPI. And um, I number my pictures after I scan them. I number them in the back upper right corner. Uh, in the order in which I scan them, or I can write on the back the name of the people. Um, I put here, I will, actually when I hold that thought about the soft lead pencil, but you do wanna write softly and small and sequentially and the computer numbering always do a 001 or a 002 or a 0001 if you have a lot of pictures. Otherwise it will be in odd number order. Um, I also use a digital photo organizer. There are lots of those on the market. Um, I uh, use the memory web. Um, so preserving your snapshots, you wanna put information on the back. If you have paper images, that means anything before the mid 20th century, you can use an 8B pencil, and that's a B, not an H. But if you have those resin coated ones, the ones from the 1960s, you know what I'm talking about, they feel like they're plastic. To write on the back of those, you're gonna need a pigment ink pen, like a Zig marker, Z-I-G. Individual non-PVC sleeves or polyester sleeves are the way to go for these, especially with color images, that stuck together photo you were talking about, um, somebody was mentioning in the chat. Color images, when they get exposed to temperature and humidity changes, they get sticky and they stick together and there's virtually no way to get them apart. You can try a professional photo conservator, but I'm not even sure they can help. Uh, acid and lignin-free albums are the way to go. 
You want to make sure you're protecting these. Definitely not those ones with the magnetic pages, which are nothing more than glue strips. Those will destroy your pictures. And you want to make sure you tell the story and that you share the images with other members of the family. Now, I mentioned saving negatives, and this is really key. So negatives will get, can give you the best digital output up to 4,000 DPI. Um, scanned photos, you can scan around 300 to 1,200 DPI. It all depends on what your scanner does for maximum DPI. But you can scan negatives yourself with something called a slide scanner or with an attachment for my flatbed, which is what I was using today. I would like to talk um, just for a second about some early 20th century negatives. They're called nitrate negatives and they do not have safety written on the side. They smell, they get sticky, they turn to powder and these were still negatives and moving picture film. They are however, extremely flammable and combustible. So when you read in the newspaper about movie houses burning down, they were probably using nitrate moving picture film um, and it caught fire. If you think you might have nitrate film, you cannot dispose of it yourself. You actually have to go to your local fire department. Um, I don't have any pictures of any. I don't have any here. Um, I don't want it. Um, and they do, they smell like sort of vinegary. They smell different. Resin coated paper, I mentioned that from the 1960s on. They crack. Uh, they're coated with plastic. They get sticky, as I mentioned. You have to use a special photo marker pen. And the Zig, the Zig photo signature pen is not for use on paper-based images. It will bleed into the paper, so you don't want to do that. So I just wanted to mention resin-coated paper again because it's so prevalent in our late 20th century images. But I know this is the part of the presentation you're super interested in, which is how can you make them look better? So I've had a lot of fun with this, as usual, Esther. Uh, Instagram, the sort of social proof for the My Heritage tools are that they truly come alive and that people love the new photo tools. And I love the new photo tools. So here's an eye popper example for you. 1952, New York City. That's my mom. This is one of her snapshots. She went with her friends. And you can just see the flowers are sort of pink. But what happened with these early images is they sometimes shifted colors. So they would go to red or to blue, to um, yellow. And this is one of those ones that went completely red. So with the new My Heritage Photo Restore tool, which recognizes that this was a color image. So you have enhancement and you have colorization, but you also now have the, the restoration of color. That's another option. So when you upload a color image, it automatically knows its color and gives you the photo restoration. Would you like to see what it did with this? Because this was pretty cool. Ready? That's the before and the after. I think it looks pretty good. It looks amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was an eye popper for sure. What a difference, wow. What a difference. I didn't have much hope for it. I was really pushing the system with all of these images, Esther. Now and this I one have, is really special, wow. I have a lot of really bad pictures. So I'm your test case. <laughs> 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 and then let's talk for a minute about how does it work with Polaroids? So Polaroids are not very sharp focused, right? They're not very expensive cameras. And you can see a little bit on the left just how fuzzy that is. The other thing about Polaroids, and I'm talking about Polaroids right from the swinger, uh, like I had a swinger with those toxic chemicals, all those images are gone. You can't see a thing because the chemicals have kept working. Um, this is an SX-70 uh, picture on the left. On the right, I have enhanced it to sharpen the features in the photograph. I think it's much better and then boosted the color just a little bit. So it's springtime um, with that house. I think it looks a lot better, but Polaroids are you, really, you need to scan them all immediately if you haven't done it yet, because the SX-70s and the plastic, they crack. And if the chemicals never, they can just keep developing um, for a long time and ruin your pictures. And plus 
the ones that you had to apply the chemicals for to, uh, sometimes those don't work as well. Now, here's a type of snapshot. I'm not sure how many of you had one, but I had one. I had a camera for a brief period of time that took a floppy disk, like a small one, like a hard disk. Um, really poor quality images. If anybody has one of these that they've downloaded to their computer, will you send it to me? Because I didn't have that camera for very long. I really hated it um, and returned it. Um, plus, there's no way for you to, you're going to have trouble getting the images off those hard uh, drives. Uh, but if anybody has one of these digital cameras, the digital images from one of these cameras, I would love to see it. And what we haven't talked about are the little disc cameras where the negatives are like literally not even one inch square. Those are really, really difficult and really poor quality. So I'm not sure again what the My Heritage enhancement tool would do. So if you have a did you have one of those disc images you want me to try, um, I'm looking for some tests. All right, we're back to my grandmother. Here she is crying over her birthday cake. And as I mentioned, it's an iconic image in our family. Um, we lived in the same uh, house as she did. She lived upstairs from us. And so I saw her every day. Um, and you can just see she's got a little bit of a plaid outfit on. She's got that ivy wallpaper. Um, and she's crying over her birthday cake. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Now this was a really difficult one. So sometimes with these black and th with these images that are really faded, it's worth trying a different way first. Um, so I try them both ways all the time. I play with the photo tools that are on the market. So I turned this one into a black and white and you can see there's the regular black and white and I turned it into black and white using Vivapix, um, which is another package on the market. But then, I used my heritage and enhanced it. And you can see how her face and the background just pops right out. So here's the other thing I wanna show you. I wanna show you a comparison of these images. So there's the black and white. There's the black and white in, on, the, on the upper right, enhanced and colorized as a black and white. You can see the color's not 100%. Then at the bottom, uh, is the original on the left. And then on the right is the color restoration. And I apologize, Esther, I forgot to run the enhancement on this part of it, but it would sharpen it right up. Um, and I'll show you one of these uh, blown up, but you can see there's a lot more uh, color uh, in it. And here it is sharpened and color restoration. Um, the IVs are different colors, but again, you can manipulate that a little bit within the program by clicking the little wheel. I don't know if you can see my, right here, this little gear. This will bring you to the color restoration settings, and then you can play with the settings. And you can see already, I switched to the alternative model, and then I moved the saturation point, and suddenly all the colors in the IV are gone, and now it is truly green, um, as it should be. Uh, oops, oops. So you can play with these tools in that little gear. There's a way for you to do things like contrast enhancement and manual rendering. Yeah, um, have a good time with it. Uh, and one of the best parts of this, Esther, and I don't know, um, I didn't see this the last time I did these, but in when you're in the little gear and you can see all the color rest, oh goodness, that's my mouse hang around. Um, you can hold your mouse on the image and it will show you the bef the earlier change and the change that you're showing right now. So you can compare them without deciding you wanna save one or the other and then you get to decide which one you wanna save. So here's uh, the program I used to turn it into a black and white. So I could take it from color to black and white. But one of the things I want to, that I love about the MyHeritage photo tools, and MyHeritage really is the industry leader on photo tools. 
um, is you want to be able to tell the story of this image. And you can use my signature five of the who, what, where, when, and why questions to tell the story. So organize your thoughts. This is on the app. It is available for iOS and Android. And I'm so happy it's available for iOS. So what's the true story behind this woman crying in front of her birthday cake? This is a story I want to tell because I put this image up, uh, up on my Facebook page and a cousin who only met our grandmother a couple of times because they lived in another part of the country said that she wanted to know the story behind this picture. The story is a happy one and a sad one. Um, this was my grandmother's uh, 70th birthday party. And this was her very first ever birthday cake. Um, and there's a story behind that as well. Um, my mom made that cake. So it's a pretty good story. Uh, but that's why she's crying right there in front of that cake. Because it was her very first ever birthday cake just for her. Um, and I'm going to tell that story in the app. And then I'm going to share that with my cousin who is desperate for more information. 1970s images. Remember I said they're just horrible? They are horrible. They're on resin coated paper. They're on a matte finish. It's almost like a linen. You print it out and it looks awful. Um, the top one is the original. The bottom one is the color restored with enhancement. It's somewhat better. You can't, you can't make bad perfect, um, but it did make it better. And again, there's the tools that I can play with. It defaults to the January 2021 model. All of these things work on an algorithm and they are going to get better. And there will likely be other color restoration models. If I know my heritage, they're already working on tweaks. But what happens about the negatives? This is what you wanted to know, right? So I played around this morning and scan a negative. And I have an Epson uh, V550, and I don't think they make it anymore. Um, so I used photo mode, and I went in, and I did transparency, and I scanned at a high resolution, um, 600 DPI, and I zoomed in on a frame of the negative and came up with this. This is just a random picture taken on a street in Montreal sometime in the 1970s. And I want to just show you that you can scan these, that it is possible. And I put on color restoration here, but that doesn't mean anything because I also use the MyHeritage color restoration. It's all about using all the tools at your disposal. Maybe one tool will be enough, but you might have to use multiple tools at your disposal, like things built into your scanner, for instance. Um, and I played with all these settings to see what was going to happen. So here is the negative. Um, the before is on the left. On the right, I have, as you can see up here, enhanced and restored the colors. And it's really eye-popping. And I'm going to show you a four up in just a minute to show you how this worked. I also have the print from this negative. Um, and this is where it gets really interesting. So on the left is the negative. So there's my scan at the top. There's the enhancement and color restoration on my heritage. I think it looks great, Esther. I think it looks really good. I love the way it picked up like the shiny surfaces of the cars. And then this is the original print. It's gone a little red up in the upper right hand corner. And then eye popping even more is the color restoration feature in the My Heritage? Um, this looks even so. There are the two enhanced colorizations: one from a scan of the negative, one from a scan of the print. I can tell you right now, I'm not going to waste my time scanning a whole lot of the negatives in this series. I'm just going to scan and then enhance um, any of the important images in this series of some vacation somebody took. Um, and and fix it up. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, because I'm just about done. Um, Esther, are you there? I'm going to turn here. it over to you. But I do want to share. This is um, 
I want to share this. I made a handout for all of you to download. So I'm going to put that. Oh, I can't put it in the chat. That's we'll right. Put it I'm in. not doing it. Yeah. We'll <laughs> That's why I'm not doing it. <laughs> we'll put, the so link. put that in the chat so people can download it. It's a, it's a beautiful, you know, front and back, which I can't find on my desk right now to show you. Um, but I had somebody actually design it for me. So it looks really nice. We'll put that link in the chat for everyone. Uh, we've put a few links for uh, those of you that missed it. We put a link to the a little bit more information about the scanner and the My Heritage mobile app. Uh, we put a link to Maureen's site that you can see. And also, we just put a link to the special handout that Maureen prepared, uh, which is uh, a great present, a great treat for everyone in the audience. So definitely check that out. Um, and also, we put a links to the photo tools. So lots and lots of resources now in the comments section. I cannot tell you how much fun I had playing with all of this. And you should have seen me this morning, Esther, with that box of images. I have them all out on the dining room <laughs> table and I'm looking for the worst ones. And I've got all these digging through my closets, looking, where's my slide scanner attachment? Where's this, oh, where's wow. that? Watching YouTube videos. <laughs> You know, I was having a really good time with it. Um, and one of the questions was, can you scan slides? And yes, you can. You can scan slides. Okay. Definitely. We have a bunch of other questions, if that's okay, sure. as well. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to say um, how touching that photo of your grandmother was. What a, what a fantastic photo. And, and just after, you know, enhancing it and restoring it it's just amazing how the details just come out and all of a sudden you can see so much more so uh it just makes it even more special mm. just lovely uh, let's see we have a few a few questions here from the audience um let's see okay sandy says I love old photos. I have a challenge. Years ago, I sprayed Windex onto the glass of my daughter's photo. Um, is, it is permanent, it's, stuck. it's permanently stuck onto the glass. How do I separate the photo from the glass? Is there a way to, a way to do that? Um, you no, know, we have one of those actually from my husband's grandmother. And it's just a great picture of my husband with his two cousins and obviously somebody tried to clean it and it's stuck and then somebody tried to pull it off the only thing you can really do is scan it through the glass and then if it's a really important image um ask a photo a specially trained photo conservator if they can remove it i'm just not sure the color stuff when it sticks it sticks wow Okay, we have a question here from Pamela, and she asks, I need to find what my great great grandmother and three family were doing uh, or uh, looked like in uniform. I, I don't know what she's referring to. She's looking for a picture of them in uniform, uh, perhaps. Oh, okay. How do I go about that? So it depends on where they were serving. Were they in the US um, or in another country? Uh, there are archives and sometimes even archives associated with particular military groups. And that's where I would start. Okay. Uh, Sherry says, I recently found school yearbook photo, a school yearbook photo of my cousin, a friend's dad who died when she was 10 and didn't know what he looked like because her parents were estranged. Wow, Sherry, what a find. Um, and actually there's a, a really uh, vast yearbooks collection on my heritage. And yes. within the collection, there's actually, there, the images are already colorized for you. So you can already see them colorized straight in the yearbooks collection. So uh, a, definitely a good resource if you, if you uh, for those of you looking for yearbook photos. Um, let's see. Can I jump in for of a course, second, Esther? Of course. So somebody mentioned that they clicked the link to download the handout. It signs them up for my newsletter. That is true. If you don't want to stay on the newsletter list, you just click on subscribe after you get the handout. But it does lead you through the process. Um, but somebody asked, how do they get photos off those sticky albums? And I'm going to tell you it's something you should use every day, and that is called dental floss. Really? Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah, dental floss will help you get those images out of those magnetic albums. 
Waxed or unwaxed? <laughs> unwaxed, the Glide Dental Floss. Oh, wow. What a good trick. All right, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, Karen says, how to handle nine, uh, faded 1980s photos. So that's an easy one. <laughs> Use the My Heritage photo tools and see what comes, see what happens with them. Yeah, the My Heritage Restore. It's um, myheritage.com slash uh, in color, and it will help you restore those yellow hues that often come to those faded photos. Uh, just like that, that example that Maureen showed us where you couldn't see any color practically, but you knew that it was a colored photo and uh, what a difference it made there i just uh, i couldn't help but notice in the in the comment section after you shared that photo that there were just so many wows <laughs> well you know as i'm going through this new box of photos i'm like oh this one's really bad i wonder what it will do on the my heritage tool <laughs> amazing amazing um let's see uh barbara says uh, how do you handle photos put in albums with transparent sleeve pages, which have gotten stuck? So you're talking about the magnetic albums with the glue strips. Uh, if the plastic is stuck to them, that's a problem. But if it's the image that's stuck to the page, then the dental floss will help with that. Okay. Katie says, what resolution do you use on your scanner? I have a scanner, but it does not scan pictures very well. I scan at 600 to 1200 DPI, and then I have a portable hard drive, an SSD drive that I store them on. Plus I back them up in the cloud, uh, and then I back them up through my photo organizing software as well, the memory web software that I use. I have like three backups. Oh, wow. Better safe than sorry. Better safe said. than sorry, definitely. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So um, that's all the time for questions that we have. Um, everyone, please check out Maureen's handout. I think you'll find it very, very helpful. And of course, you can always rewatch today's session and all of our previous Facebook sessions on the My Heritage Facebook page, facebook.com oh, yeah. slash My Heritage. There's oh, a handout. Oh, there's a handout. Yeah. Okay. Um, under the video section, you'll be able to see today's session and rewatch it in case you've missed anything uh, and keep it handy, as well as all of our previous sessions. So, we, Maureen, we received so many amazing comments here about um, old photos, special photos that people have uh, that they've held on to or that they have in their, in their family that they were lucky enough to uh to have so i'll read out um one runner up <laughs> and then one winner so our runner up today is marilyn skelton and marilyn said one of my most treasured photos is one from 1848 from boston john left home at age nine he was marooned at age fifteen age 15 in the war of 1812 he left he was captured and imprisoned in england before finally making it to the usa um, his story was the one that got me into genealogy as a teenager so that's a, a photo from 1848 of of john so here's the thing about that 1812 prison the prison records are at the national archives at kew in england i've seen them and it lists like a whole list of the people that were were prison like American prisoners in the UK and where they were from and other information. Just as an aside, just a random connection. Wow! So Marilyn, you should definitely check that out. Look into that uh, when you can travel. Maybe that's your next destination. <laughs> uh, and our winner today is from Mav Rogan, and she said, my most exciting photo was found in an old suitcase in Ireland. The photo was of a man holding an eight-month-old baby girl. At the time, it was a mystery, but thanks to a small DNA match a few years later, we pieced together the story, and it turns out that the photo was posted from Australia, and the baby 
is now 90 years old. The photo helped reconnect the Australian and Irish parts of the family and led me to taking an Australian cousin to meet his Irish family and bringing him on a tour of his ancestral home place. Wow. What a, what a great story. So we'll be in touch with you story. through private message. Congratulations. Uh, thank you to everybody else who shared stories. I know that I'm going to go back and read a lot of them because they're just uh, so incredible. And I love hearing uh, the stories behind the photos, not just as you as you know, Maureen, it's not just the photo. It's it's who's behind it, the stories, uh, what they mean to the family that make them just so, so incredible and such treasures. Yeah. And don't be surprised if I scroll through and answer some more questions. <laughs> Amazing. We would love that. We would love that. So right. thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure to host you on our Facebook lives. And we Bye, wish everyone. you all a good day. Bye, everybody. Bye.